Welcome to the next installment of The Last Word in ALAS podcast. I'm Jennifer Smith, your host, and I'm the Director of Education and Scientific Affairs at ALAS. With me today is Dr. Isabel Jimenez. Isabel is a postdoctoral research fellow and resident in comparative medicine at Johns Hopkins University, combining clinical residency training and research leading to a PhD. She completed her undergraduate and veterinary degrees from Cornell University, where she was actively involved in research. Isabel also completed an internship in general medicine and surgery at the Animal Medical Center. We are thrilled to welcome Isabel today and look forward to hearing about her recent JLAS paper titled Behavioral Evaluation of Laboratory Housed Ferrets in Different Enclosure Sizes. Hello, Isabel. Thank you for joining us today. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about your background? Hi, thank you so much for having me on the podcast today. Um, So I'm a third year resident on the research track in the program at Hopkins. So I've completed my uh, clinical residency training and I'm working towards my PhD. And I currently conduct full-time research in the laboratory of Dr. Arturo Casadevall at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Wow, thank you for that. It's really great to have somebody on the podcast who's starting out their career. Um, Your enthusiasm is catching, and I I really appreciate you being here. All right, well, we really want to hear also about your paper. So could you introduce our listeners to your team and tell us why you designed and completed this study? Absolutely. Um, I completed this study as part of my residency training. So my faculty advisors for the project were Dr. Jason Villano, the Director of Rodent Resources, and Dr. Lydia Hopper, the Director of Behavioral Management here at Hopkins. And uh, also on our team were veterinary technicians Morgan Craney and Kayla Birch-Strong, Missy Painter from the Behavior Team, and Dr. Jessica Plunkard, one of my co-residents at the time who has since completed her training. So we had a diverse combination of experience and expertise on our team, which I think really contributed to building a well-rounded study design. Um, But why did we want to evaluate enclosure sizing in ferrets? So uh, ferrets are pretty commonly used for infectious disease and behavioral research. And based on research in other species, we know that space itself, as well as the option of choice, in other words, being able to select which parts of spaces to access and use, have important implications for animal welfare. And spaces that are inadequate can cause stress or distress, which can compromise animal welfare and can also impact study results. But there have been very few studies that actually evaluate these aspects with regards to ferrets. And many of the studies that do exist focus on pet ferrets. So the impetus for this study was really to evaluate the effect of cage size on ferrets housed in a research setting, primarily by looking at behavioral indicators. So to do this, we created a crossover design where pairs of ferrets were first housed in a single cage and then transitioned with their partner into a cage that was twice as large. And we also had pairs of ferrets that made the opposite transition from the double cage into the single cage. And then we recorded their behaviors over the course of two weeks in each cage size. Great. Wow. Thank you for that detailed introduction and and summary. So for our listeners who don't regularly house ferrets, and I I was one of those, could you briefly address the current state of regulations governing ferret housing in the U.S. and how that may differ for our friends in Europe? In the United States, the Department of Agriculture oversees the use of ferrets in research. So the documents that we look to for guidance on their care and use are the Animal Welfare Act and Animal Welfare Regulations, as well as the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals. And both of these documents recognize the importance of providing all animals with housing that is appropriate in both size and design and acknowledges the potential detrimental impacts of inadequate housing. But while these documents outline minimum dimensions for enclosures in species like dogs and rabbits, there are also many species for which that is not the case, and that includes ferrets. Um, Instead, what constitutes an appropriate enclosure size for these so-called other species um, is really left open to interpretation and therefore up to the discretion of the institution. The animal welfare regulations state that enclosures shall be constructed and maintained so as to provide sufficient space to allow each animal to make normal postural and social adjustments with adequate freedom of movement. Because there are not many studies that tell us what is necessarily adequate for ferrets, different institutions house their ferrets in caging that varies in size and design. And also these cage dimensions are not uh, always reported in the literature. 
On the other hand, the European Convention for the Protection of Vertebrate Animals does prescribe minimum guidelines for floor space for ferrets, and these are based on whether they are housed in pairs or groups, um, their body weight and age. Great. Thank you for covering that so well. We really appreciate that, especially for our listeners who may not house ferrets regularly or may be tasked with housing ferrets in the future. So thanks. So your study design uses a behavioral ethogram. And for those of you who are following along with the paper, that's figure one, that characterizes ferret behavior. And could you share how you developed that and used it in the study? And could you also explain the distinctions between the neutral positive welfare indicators or PWI versus negative welfare indicators or NWI? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to evaluate the behavior of ferrets in our study under these different caging conditions, we looked to the literature on normal ferret behaviors and combined this with the expertise from veterinarians and behaviorists on our team in order to develop our ethogram. The domestic ferret is somewhat unique in that this species, Mastella putorius furo, is only found in captivity if you don't count feral escaped ferrets in some parts of the world. So it's not quite possible to say what ferrets quote unquote in the wild would do. So we have to look at what they do as pets. And we also look to the behavior and their life history of the wild relatives such as European polecats and American mink. The ethogram is really the basis for all of the data that we generate from the study. Um, it determines how we classify what we see on a video. And therefore it is very important to ensure that the descriptions are very clear and can be implemented by different individuals. For example, rather than just stating pacing, you have to define that pacing means walking from one end of the cage to the other end, turning around and then repeating the full pattern a certain number of times. This kind of really precise definition prevents inter-observer variability in which one observer codes a behavior as pacing while another calls it locomotion. In particular, we devoted a lot of attention to distinguishing rough play from true aggression. Um, ferrets engage in rough play or play fighting, and this is a normal behavior and an expected component of social bonding, and uh, particularly in young animals that are trying to establish that dominance hierarchy. So we don't want to misclassify that as aggression that might require intervention. In general, in rough play, both ferrets are showing receptivity and reciprocity through their body language, which can include having their ears forward and tail raised, alternating who is instigating the play and who is receiving. And sometimes this play involves chasing, tackling each other, wrestling or play biting. But overall, it very much still appears to be a give and take. And both animals are actively engaged in that session and choosing to remain involved. Conversely, with aggression, one ferret tends to be instigating the aggression while the other is consistently trying to avoid the interaction. They might run away back into a corner, hiss, keep their tail down, assume submissive postures, while the instigating ferret might engage in sustained neck biting, shake or drag the other ferret. And overall, this aggression appears to be a lot more one-sided. So once we had developed that ethogram, we used it to code the behaviors based on the videos that we had obtained. And our behaviors were divided into neutral behaviors, positive welfare indicators, and negative welfare indicators. Neutral behaviors included inactivity, urinating or defecating, feeding, locomotion, and self-grooming. Positive welfare indicators included social play, solitary play, and allogrooming. And negative welfare indicators included conspecific aggression and stereotypic behaviors, such as cage biting, pacing, or escape attempts. Great. Thank you for that summary. So like me, I'm sure most of our listeners will want to hear more about the study design related to the cages, um, how you were able to make some modifications that were ferret specific, and how the cages were used and set up in this study. Could you talk about that? Yes, so we knew that we wanted to keep as many factors constant as possible while we were testing these two different enclosure sizes. At our institution, our rabbits are housed in cages such that two adjacent cages have a connecting tunnel, which can be opened or closed with a sliding door. And that allows us to provide pairs of rabbits or rabbits with kits with additional space when needed. So we thought this was a great caging design to adapt for the ferrets in our study because it would allow us to easily control the amount of space that the ferrets had access to throughout the course of the study while keeping other factors constant. Otherwise, we would have had to use racks with two different cage sizes, and we probably would be dealing with variables like different materials, different smells, and potentially other confounding factors. So instead, we were able to set up our study design so that ferrets would start out in either a single or double 
rabbit cage. And then when it came time to switch to the other cage size, we would simply open or close that sliding door. So they got to keep at least one space that they were already familiar with. Because these cages were designed for rabbits and not ferrets, we did make some modifications to make sure they were safe and appropriate to house ferrets. Um, so we did add a lid to the top of the J feeder to ensure that the ferrets would not be able to exit the cage through the hopper. We also added a length of PVC pipe to block a gap at the top of the cages that would have allowed ferrets to climb over the tunnel and into the other cage, even if the sliding door was closed, which obviously rabbits can't do that, but ferrets would have been able to. And we also added a clear plastic panel to the bottom of each cage with small holes that were drilled a few centimeters apart. The original holes in the floor of the rabbit cages are quite large, so we wanted to make sure that the ferrets wouldn't get their feet caught. And this also helped to reduce food waste because with the larger holes, anything dropped onto the floor would immediately fall through into the cage pan. This panel also allowed us to look at space utilization. So we used electrical tape uh, to make four quadrants on the underside of those acrylic panels. And those were visible on camera so we could actually track which quadrant of the cage the ferrets were spending time in. Great. Well, thanks for that summary. Again, very detailed and, and very helpful for our listeners. So your study methodology design included behavioral coding from scan sampling. And we'd like to hear more about that technology, how it was used. And also, maybe you could comment on the non-invasive method of identification that you came up with that I thought was quite unique. Yeah, um, so I'll touch on the identification really quick first. Um, our ferrets are identified by ear tags, but um, you can only really read the number by lifting up the ferret and looking at the, the ear tag. It's a pretty small number. So um, that was not something that was going to be visible on video. And so we wanted to make sure that we could track which member of the pair um, was which on all of the video recordings we were obtaining. Um, in addition, we also kept our ferrets on a standard light cycle. And so there were recording periods that were at night, which also means we don't get color on our video. Um, you know, it's a little bit harder to see, um, even though those are cameras that are that are designed to be used at night. So what we did was we shaved um, little patches on the back of the ferrets. One ferret either got um, two patches or just one patch. And this way we could uh, basically differentiate the two animals very easily uh, from afar, which was super helpful uh, for analyzing that video footage. Now we recorded ferrets continuously for five hours a day, five days a week with those time blocks spread out throughout the day. So all in all, the study generated about 400 hours of video footage. We then needed to take that footage and apply our ethogram to determine the frequency of behaviors that were being performed. So there are two main ways to do this. Continuous sampling means that you watch the video and you record every behavior that occurs throughout the entire recording. This is the gold standard for assessing behavior from a recording because you don't miss any behaviors, but of course this takes a lot of time. Instantaneous sampling or scan sampling, on the other hand, means that you select specific instances of time at which to evaluate the study. So for this study, we selected blocks out of those hour long recordings and we paused the video every 30 seconds on a timer and recorded what the ferret was doing at that instant. Scan sampling saves time, but it also comes with some important considerations. Um, first of all, behaviors are not random. If you observed me for 24 hours, chances are I would be a lot more likely to be sleeping at 2 a.m. compared to 2 p.m. And certain behaviors might also be more likely to happen in relation to other behaviors. So I might be more likely to eat and then drink water rather than wake up from sleeping in order to eat. The other major consideration with scan sampling is that you have to record what the ferret is doing at that exact moment when your timer goes off. Not what they were doing two seconds ago, but what they're doing now. Um, this is challenging because as humans, we are very interested in new things. So let's say my timer goes off every 30 seconds. I could watch a ferret sleep for five minutes and then it gets up and plays with a toy for 10 seconds and goes back to sleep and then my timer goes off. I have to record that the animal is still sleeping, um, which is you know definitely difficult, right? I'm like, oh, this cool thing just happened and I wanna record that, but you need to be careful not to over record those interesting behaviors and really stick to the predetermined time points for recording. Um, so overall, when applying scan sampling, you have to evaluate a large number of time points so you don't miss infrequent behaviors, and you have to evaluate various intervals across the day to get an accurate representation of the animal's actual activity budget. Um, so all in all, I watched about 10,000 observations for this study. Wow. That is a lot of time, <laughs> a lot of commitment, and we really appreciate you summarizing that for us. So before we move on to the results and sort of more discussion, um, I wanted to ask quickly about your use of female ferrets. 
and I, I believe these were ovarian hysterectomized in-house. And I just wondered if you could share why you chose female subjects or and or if there were any plans to include studies with male ferrets in the future. Yeah, so male ferrets are larger than female ferrets. Um, in some cases, adult males can weigh up to two and a half kilograms compared to our females who weighed about one kg. And based on the cages we had available for this study, we felt that female ferrets would be a better fit. Um, Male ferrets can also be more aggressive than females in some cases, although that's not always true. Um, but practically speaking, we also were able to do this study in large part because a research group here at Hopkins acquired these female ferrets for neurobehavioral work, and they allowed us to evaluate them for this non-invasive study before transferring them over. So it was also um, a bit of a practical decision as well. We don't currently have plans to do this study in male ferrets, but I do think the results would be very interesting if we were able to get some funding for that. Um, there is some literature out there suggesting that a pair consisting of an intact male with a spayed female actually had significantly less fighting than two spayed females. So it would be very interesting to look at male-female pairings in that context as well, although that would potentially be less likely um, to be translatable to how most researchers are probably keeping pair-housed ferrets, but interesting nonetheless um, if we had the opportunity. Interesting, nonetheless. I love that you brought that up. I think that that would be very interesting as well. And whether or not applicable, I don't know. But I, again, I think the behavior aspect would be very interesting. Okay, so let's move on to results and discussion. Could you just maybe provide a, an overview of your results and your interpretation for us? Yes, so the predominant behavior was inactivity, with ferrets resting with their cage mate 86 to 88% of the time. Ferrets also spent time engaging in positive welfare indicators, which were social play, solitary play, and alley grooming, and there was no significant effect of cage size on activity level or on the rate of positive welfare indicators, which suggested to us that both cage sizes provided adequate welfare. We observed an extremely low rate of negative welfare indicators across the whole study. Each negative welfare indicator made up a fraction of a percent of the total activity budget, which further supports the idea that the ferrets were experiencing adequate welfare under both housing conditions. The negative welfare indicator rates were so low, however, that we weren't able to perform statistical analyses to assess whether there was an effect of cage sizing. Um, as an example, the overall rate of aggression was 0.7% in ferrets that were housed in single cages and 0% in ferrets housed in double cages. We did note that, interestingly, ferrets that fought in the single cage once moved into a double cage, those pairs stopped fighting entirely. But moving ferrets from a double cage into a single cage didn't result in new aggression between that pair. So taken together, those results suggested to us that cage size is certainly not the sole determinant of aggression, but that for ferrets that are predisposed to aggression, providing more space could be an effective intervention. All of those ferrets continued to show signs of an intact pair bond, such as sleeping together and playing with each other throughout the experiment. Um, and that was not significantly different for the pairs that were fighting. So we can assume that, you know, even though they were having some aggression, they were also still deriving a lot of positive benefits from being with that particular partner. So hearing about the high percentage of time spent inactive, were you surprised by that? And, and why do you think that that is? Yeah, um, domestic ferrets have been reported to spend over 60% of their time asleep, and sleeping in pairs or groups is a sign of bonding in ferrets, um, but I was a bit surprised that they spent quite so much time asleep, and in particular, I thought that ferrets that had access to more space might spend more time playing or exploring, but that didn't turn out to be the case. I think it's also important to note that we were also being very mindful not to enter the room during any of those recording windows. So it's possible that in a real world setting, the ferrets would be receiving additional stimulation from interacting with people and might therefore not be sleeping as much. Um, interestingly, both groups of ferrets actually became more inactive over time, regardless of the cage size. So this could potentially reflect progressive acclimation to the presence of the cameras, which were actually quite close to the cages. And so the ferrets were um, curious about these things that were near uh, the outside of their cage and, uh, you know, becoming more acclimated to their housing condition, potentially increased bonding or increased comfort and sort of decreased exploration as these environmental factors became less novel to them. But we don't know that for sure. Just some hypotheses about why that might be. Yes. And speaking of hypotheses on that, I really enjoyed reading your discussion on further classification of inactivity with eyes open or eyes closed. And I just wondered if you could comment on that. 
Yeah, so in some prior studies, um, they have differentiated inactivity uh, with eyes open being a sign of boredom, um, whereas inactivity with eyes closed being, you know, just the ferret sleeping. Um, and so there are some papers that go into great depth about that. Unfortunately, in our study, we weren't really able to always see the ferret's faces. Um, so we didn't try to differentiate whether they were uh, sleeping or not sleeping. We just said, you know, are they inactive? Do they appear to be sort of in a sleeping posture? But we couldn't actually see if their eyes were open or closed. So that's not something we're able to evaluate from the data that we collected, um, but certainly something that in the future, um, you know, using more cameras or potentially cameras that are integrated into the cage rather than just um, outside uh, the cage, film, you know, filming through the cage bars might be able to pick up more uh, subtle signs like that. Great. So could you also discuss your results regarding the ferret's preference for single versus double caging? Absolutely. I thought these results were extremely interesting. Um, ferrets pair housed in double cages very quickly developed a preferred cage, and they then spent the majority of their time in that cage throughout the two weeks. Notably for ferrets moving from single to double caging after the crossover, their favorite cage was not always the same cage that they had prior experience with. And ferrets in double cages also stayed in the same cage as their partner 96% of the time. So rather than splitting up so that each ferret could have their own space, which effectively would mean a larger floor space monopolized by each individual animal, they really preferred sharing a smaller space together. And their choice of preferred cage also affected how they spent their time. So ferrets slept together almost exclusively in the preferred cage, whereas their time dedicated to social play, eating, and other activities was divided a lot more evenly between the two cages. It's also important to note that ferrets in the double cage also had access to an additional lixit and food hopper. And I had thought that providing two hoppers instead of one would decrease food competition, and therefore those ferrets might spend more time eating apart from each other. But actually what we observed was that regardless of the cage size, ferrets spent about 22% of their time eating from the same feeder at the same time, which we called co-feeding. And we also saw an increase in co-feeding over time in both groups. So to us, that suggests that co-feeding is a social bonding activity, and we know that to be true, you know, in other species. And the fact that that increased over time also supports progressive bonding among these pairs. Um, so taken together, those results further demonstrate the importance of social bonding and the benefits of pair housing, and how in some cases that even outweighs um, the absolute space that they're provided. You know, they're choosing to spend a lot of time together, even if it means they're sort of in a, a smaller place together. Oh, I love that. And I, I love um, more of the discussion where you talk really about choice as a welfare benefit. And I know we'll talk about that in a minute, but thanks for bringing that up. So um, let's talk a little bit about the preferred time spent in the tunnel or with the tube enrichment device, because that was also very interesting. Yeah, you'll recall that these double cages are connected by a tunnel in the middle. So even the single housed ferrets had access to this tunnel area. It was just closed off for them at, at one end. Um, so both groups had this sort of sheltered hiding place and they greatly preferred that space, particularly for sleeping, which makes sense because in, uh, you know, quote unquote, the wild, right? Ferrets are animals that like to tunnel. They like to burrow. Um, they don't always want to necessarily be out in the open. And so giving them that sheltered area was something that they really valued. Um, all the ferrets also received a large corrugated plastic tube as one of their enrichment items. And we found that the tube was involved in 98% of all enrichment associated interactions. So it greatly won out over the bell and the Kong toy. Um, and ferrets in double cages only received one tube. And we recorded that the tube was in their preferred cage 75% of the time. So the cages were changed out every two days. We actually did not keep track of where husbandry staff was placing the tube after the cage changes. So we can't really know whether the initial placement of that tube affected if the ferrets chose that cage to be their favorite. But what we did see was that the preferred cage didn't seem to switch back and forth. You know, they tended to pick one and then that was the cage that they liked to be in for the most part. We did see multiple instances of ferrets working together to move the tube from the non-preferred cage through the connecting tunnel and into the preferred cage. And this was one situation in which I wish we could have had video on the JLAS paper because it would have been so cute to be able to show um, some of these behaviors to readers. But what I suspect is that the cage preference was not necessarily tied to the tube itself, but they just later brought their favorite item into their preferred area. Oh, I love that. I love that commentary. Thank you.
Um, so I know you also uh, recorded body weight, and I know that the results um, maybe weren't as exciting, but could you just comment on body weight trends that you saw? Yeah, absolutely. So we definitely wanted to make sure that ferrets weren't losing weight, um, you know, which can, of course, be a sign of stress or negative welfare, and that was not something that we saw. Um, but we also saw that there was no effect of cage size on weight, and all the ferrets gained weight over the course of the study. Um, so we weren't really surprised about the results in the sense that ferrets do spend a lot of time inactive, and in a research setting, they're probably not exercising enough in either of these cage sizes to really make a difference in their weight. And I think the primary driver of their weight really was the amount of food they received. Um, they had free access to food during the study. So I think in reality, it would be better to feed ferrets a specific portion that would meet their caloric needs without exceeding them. Um, and certainly if we weren't you know, trying to keep everything constant for the study period, um, we probably would have implemented a little bit of a diet um, for them. But ultimately they were all healthy throughout the entire study. They did just gain a little bit of, little bit of weight throughout. Great. So what were the biggest takeaways from your study? Any surprises? And we always kind of want to know how this type of study could impact animal welfare. This study demonstrates that both the cage sizes we tested provided adequate welfare for pair-housed female ferrets, meaning that there is not necessarily a distinct welfare reason to give all ferrets those larger double cages. This is important from a practical standpoint because we want to provide the best welfare, but we also need to be cognizant of considerations like how much space is in the room, um, how many racks we need to have, which impacts cage wash efficiency, and so on. Um, in addition, the single cage is much more similar in size to the dimensions of many existing ferret housing systems. We did a survey of other institutions to kind of see, you know, um, what people were commonly housing their ferrets in. So it was important to us to be able to demonstrate that existing ferret housing conditions are most likely adequate. Another major finding is that social bonding is so valuable, which was evidenced by how often the ferrets were voluntarily sharing the same space. They slept together. They liked to eat from the same feeder at the same time. Um, and like I mentioned before, the value that they ascribe to social support even seemed to outcompete the value of absolute space in some cases um, with ferrets in the double cages, still primarily spending the majority of their time, you know, 96% of their time in one cage with their partner. In addition, the double caging also gave the ferrets more choice and control over where to spend time, which is also beneficial for welfare. Um, and so, you know, if your institution can accommodate it, I do think there's a benefit to kind of giving them those separate areas as well. Um, and it might not even be about the distinct uh, larger size, but the fact that in this case, we sort of had two rooms connected by a tunnel, right? So they could choose to go back and forth, and it was kind of two spaces they could utilize. Um, so thinking about more complex caging um, is also something that I think would be beneficial and certainly something that could be studied um, in the future, in, in future research projects, whether, you know, multi-level caging or sort of more complex configurations of caging um, are, you know, more beneficial for these animals that kind of like to explore and burrow and things like that. Um, although we had very low rates of negative welfare indicators overall, we did see that pattern that I mentioned in which ferrets that were fighting in single cages, once they transitioned into double cages, they stopped fighting. So we do think that for pairs of ferrets that are predisposed to aggression, either because of previously observed behavior or because of signalment, um, providing more space could be an effective intervention and thus could be a really valuable alternative to single housing or re pairing because we showed how important social support is in this study. So if the ferrets are showing some aggression, but otherwise, you know, they're still showing signs of that intact pair bond, then the double caging could be a really good option um, to ameliorate aggression while still keeping that pair together. Um, finally, I think the implementation of video recordings was really key in being able to observe aggression. Ferrets very quickly change their behavior when observers enter the room. They're very curious animals. They like to, you know, kind of see what's going on. Um, and aggression was already happening at such a low rate. So without recordings, I doubt we would have, you know, even observed at all or maybe observed very um, much more infrequently. So to me, that means that if in practice, if you're observing your ferret's cage side and you are able to observe even a few instances of fighting, you might want to consider that it's probably actually happening at a much higher rate in the background and should be investigated further, such as through behavioral recordings, you know, um, these methods that we can actually watch what they're doing without having our presence um, interfere with that. All right. 
Well, that is all the time we have for today. Isabel, we greatly appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. I know our audience learned a lot. I did too. Now, for everyone listening, we invite you to subscribe and leave us your comments and questions in the section below. Additionally, we, we invite you to consider submitting your current or future research to the ALAS Scientific Journals. That's JLAS or CompMed. You can also follow us on our socials or just email at info at ALAS.org. We want your feedback. We want to know what you thought of this episode. Finally, thanks again for listening to The Last Word in ALAS podcast. Please be on the lookout for information on future podcast episodes. Mm-hmm.